Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. Earlier this year, I released a book, and the title of it really scared the media. The title was God, Guns, Grits, and Gravy. And it's not a book of Southern recipes, though a lot of people thought that it was. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But the book was really a description of what often is called flyover country, a great part of America between the coast where people aren't creeped out if someone comes up and says, I'm praying for you. That part of the country where if somebody tells you they just took down a deer or a, an elk with a Weatherby 300 mag, nobody jumps under the table and gets afraid because they think you're homicidal. People order grits for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And where gravy is a beverage. I grew up in an area, like so many of you did, where the gun nuts are not the people who own guns. The gun nuts are the people who are afraid of firearms and think that the whole country would be safer if we would take them away from law-abiding people and create a gun-free zone where we're all sitting ducks. Like so many of you, my whole culture as a kid growing up was not unfamiliar with firearms. I got my first BB gun when I was five. It was a Daisy 25. There's, I still have the same gun in mint condition. When I was seven, I got a pellet gun. When I was nine, I got a Springfield single shot 22. When I was 10, I got a 20 gauge shotgun that my dad had had and he passed it on to me. And I still have all of those guns every last one of them. You couldn't take them from me even if it was trying to pry them from my cold, dead hands. But let me make something very clear. It's not that I love guns. I've got friends in the gun-free zones, and when I tell them I have two gun safes, because I need them, they say, you must love guns. I say, no, I don't love guns, but I love freedom. I love America. And I love the freedom to live in this country and own that which I choose to own, whether for my protection, for my pleasure, or just to drive people on the left stark raving nuts. I also love my family, and I'm going to tell you without apology that if someone were to threaten my family, I will sacrifice my life to protect them. And if necessary, I will sacrifice the life of the one who would threaten them. And if they try to hurt my family, I will tell you this, if a gun will work better than my bare hands, or a knife, or a baseball bat, or polite conversation, then I will use the gun. Any questions? <laughs> and I will also unapologetically tell you this, that I will still call 911, but it won't be so I can wait 20 minutes for help to arrive. I'll call 911 to tell them where to come and pick up the body of the person who tried to take away my family's life or my freedom. Sometimes people talk about that they have defended and fought for our flag. A few moments ago, backstage, I met a true American hero. Marcus Luttrell, a great American hero. Last year, my wife won at an auction, and she bid way more than I would have allowed it if I had known, but for my birthday, she bid on an auction of an AR-15 that Marcus had signed. I have a feeling if he hadn't signed it, she could have gotten it for a lot less money. When people say they have fought for our freedom, 
And people say they have fought for our flag. They're, they're not saying that they fought for the piece of cloth with the stars and the stripes. It is not the physical flag that they're speaking of. They're speaking of all that that flag represents. They're speaking of the incredible bold notion that every one of us have been given, not by our government, but by our God, some basic fundamental freedoms. And to make sure that those freedoms were never, never infringed upon, our founders set forth after they had finished the Constitution a set of statements that we come to know as the Bill of Rights. Those first ten amendments to the Constitution. And sometimes I wonder, did anyone in Washington ever pass ninth grade civics? Because if they ever had really read the Bill of Rights, here's what they would learn. The Bill of Rights in no way restricts my freedom as an American citizen. The Bill of Rights was not written to tell me or you what we can't do. The Bill of Rights was written to tell the government what it can't do. And when someone says they're going to use when someone says they're going to use the Bill of Rights to the Constitution to restrict our freedoms, I think they must not have read what the intent was. The flag is a symbol, and when people fight for it, they fight for that which it symbolizes. In the same way as the flag is the symbol of our freedom, firearms are the force of our freedom to guarantee that no one, no one will be able to take them from us because we are prepared, as were our founders, to give our very lives to make sure that our children live not as slaves, but as free, and that they have liberty. On three occasions, I visited Auschwitz, about an hour from Krakow, Poland. Not far from Auschwitz, just across the road and down from it is Birkenau, one of the few places in the world that was constructed uniquely to be nothing more than a factory to murder people, 10,000 a day. Every time I've been to Auschwitz and Birkenau, I'm stunned by the sights. It's a gut punch. It's a fierce reminder of what happens when a government is unchecked in its power and its ruthlessness to deem that some people are important and others are not. What happens when a government decides that some people are expendable, disposable even, that their lives are not worth as much as the lives of someone else? One of the reasons that I'm an unapologetic and ardent pro-life advocate is because I believe that the child with Down syndrome is as valuable to our culture as is the captain of the football team. I do not believe that there are people whom God doesn't love as much as he does others. When I have been to Auschwitz, I've sometimes asked, how was it ever possible for six million Jews, 11 million people total, six million of them murdered for no purpose other than their faith? How was it possible that they were marched to their murder? And as I have walked through the crematorium at Auschwitz, and I've walked down that long line of the, where the rail cars deposited people at Birkenau. I couldn't get my arms around why were people willing to get on those cattle cars and spend 48, sometimes 72 hours cramped up like chickens in a coop only to be marched to their slaughter. And of all places, the answer may be found in the New York Times, November 8, 1938. For on November the 8th of 1938, the New York Times reported that the police president of Berlin, Count Wolf Heinrich von Helldorf, ordered that the entire Jewish population would be disarmed. 
November the 8th. On November the 9th, Hitler ordered that all Jewish stores were to be destroyed and that all of the synagogues were to be burned. And the following day on November the 10th was what we now know in history as Kristallnacht, the night of the broken glass, the night in which the last vestige of freedom for the Jews was taken from them. And because they had been disarmed with 1,700 guns confiscated, 2,500 hand weapons, they had no ability or capacity to resist or to fight back. And the result was the beginning of their captivity, the end of their freedom, and the ultimate murder of six million innocent people. I visited Israel more times than I can even count anymore. My first trip was 42 years ago, back in 1973, when I was all of 17 years old. I was just there a month ago. I was there three times last year. One of the great leaders of our world today is a good friend of mine that I've known before he was in the government, when he was in, when he was out, when he's been back in, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. And he is a Churchill in a world filled with Chamberlains. And I've been in his office when he has said to me very clearly and boldly, as he's shown me a picture of Auschwitz that sits behind his desk, this will never happen again. We will never disarm. We will never allow ourselves to be enslaved again. We will never allow someone to take our freedom. They may try, they may come, but they will not meet passive indifference. They will meet the full force of every person who values their lives and values their freedom. And if one goes to the top of Masada, where the Israeli soldiers take the oath of office, when they do so, they vow this, Israel will never fall again. May I say, we as Americans have a phenomenal history upon which we stand, explained only by the providence of Almighty God. And we owe it to Him, we owe it to our founders, but most importantly, we owe it to our children and our grandchildren that we would say, we will not disarm and America will never fall. It will not fall because we will not let it. God bless you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and God bless the NRA. Thank you.